and fields of Cumbria meet the Irish Sea. A dozen gentlemen aviators have gathered, in the best barnstorming tradition, to compete in aerial tournaments across the nation, from coast to coast. Their craft are microlites, motorised dragonflies, which have brought the romance of flight within the reach of the common man. If you like, Biggles in blue jeans. This is cheap, lightweight, do-it-yourself aviation, in the manner and style of the Wright brothers. £5,000 will buy you the very top of the range among two-seaters. Pass the exams, win the licence, and you have the freedom of the air and the addictive lure of competition. The forecast to 1100 GMT is for a northwesterly airstream slowly stabilising, a warning of moderate icing and turbulence... The competitors are most of the big names in microlight flying. Bob Calvert, holder of the world altitude record at over 24,000 feet. Bob Bailey, captain of the world-beating British hang gliding team. John Hudson, microlite manufacturer, and Jeff Ball, his chief test pilot. Dick Clegg, Preston garage owner, whose brother is navigating, and from North Yorkshire, Eden Blythe, who runs a flying school. Ian Rawson and Tony Wells, both highly experienced. Go stand on the pod, Sid. Yeah. OK. And the flying cameraman, Sid Peru, whose career to date includes filming in balloons, on rock faces and down potholes. When Sid and his pilot are ready, the day can get airborne. Journey's end for the six crews, Flamborough Head near Bridlington. En route, they'll face a set of fiendish exercises, special stages designed to test their judgment, ability and nerve. The first one looks the toughest. 30 miles through the highest mountains in England, with early morning coffee waiting at Ambleside. Already the first crews are high above the 80-foot cliffs at St Bee's Head, keeping a respectful distance from its seabird colonies and hugging the coast before they swing inland. The rest follow at one-minute intervals. Blackburn's Tony Wells, flying one of the more powerful machines, is off like a rocket, even though he hasn't a clue where he's going beyond Ambleside. At the beginning of each stage, the crews get a sealed envelope giving a grid reference. They must spot markers on the way while navigating precisely and dodging all the hazards nature cares to throw at them and arrive bang on time. For time is vital, even though it's not a race, and even the slower machines are in with a chance. That's the first landmark, the lighthouse on St Bee's Head. 200 miles away, the last landmark is the lighthouse on Flamborough Head. Suddenly, the sky seems an awfully big place. Down below, the foot soldiers, conscious that, despite their humble role, the whole affair would be a nonsense without them. Across the country, a team of 30 volunteers are deploying the elusive coded markers for the crews to spot. They won't all be as easy as this one. I think so. It's going to be a bit hard. Tony Wells, the Blackburn bomber, has found it already. Yeah, 
dot and circle now. You know where you are now, which way? Back that way. Just a minute, just a minute. Keep on going. Flip to the bottom of Wastwater. Go a long way to your left now. That certainly was water. I nearly killed myself in there diving. Yeah? Yeah. With their little two-stroke motorbike engines buzzing away happily behind them, the crews are cheerfully cocky as they head over the high ground. The air is like chilled wine, the views exhilarating. Down below, the Roman fort of Medio Bogdum on the Hardknot Pass. Not exactly the prime posting of the Roman Empire, halfway up a mountain. All of a sudden, things start looking a trifle dodgy. The terrain is rough, and there's barely a pocket handkerchief down there where you could land a flying tricycle with a dead engine. Microlites will glide by themselves, but height spells time and safety. Now, and in the miles to come, the pilots face a nice decision. Fly high, play safe, and risk missing a marker. Or fly low, find the marker, gain the points, and risk an abrupt impact with a dry stone wall. Most pilots opt for safety, at least in the earlier stages. Ambleside and the end of the first leg are in view. The first crews to arrive circle to use up spare time. Bob Calvert and Eden Blythe are steaming up behind them in their slower machines. The landing site is idyllic, a Lakeland summer meadow rich with grass. And that's the last thing the crews were expecting. As they slope in on final approach, looking forward to a break, the first big snag of this gentleman's jaunt is about to bite them in the ankle. The landing field should have been mown by now, but due to a misunderstanding, the grass is dangerously long. Tony Wells, 47 seconds early, finds that the long grass slows his landing nicely. But getting back into the air, he realizes, will be rather like running through porridge. Ball and Hudson, the microite builders from Rochdale, right in the thick of it. We approach Tony Wells with a really original question. You're the first down. Yeah. How was the first leg? Oh, quite, quite not, not so bad at all, really. Not so bad. In fact, uh, finding the markers was a bit hard, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. They're either really obvious, or well, you couldn't uh, find them anyway. You couldn't find them in, life in, in you, little you know. spots, you know. But otherwise, they're great. Super, super yeah. day. 54.12. Christ, is a long way. 54.12. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Two degrees. Planning now for the second stage. The Clegg brothers are on home ground still, with the odds in their favour. Further east, they'll be flying yeah, into their rival's territory. The next leg is one of the longest, nearly 50 miles, to the tiny village of Barbon. Yorkshire's Bob Bailey, enthusiastic as ever. That was fantastic back over the mountains there, clear as a bell. When we're coming over the, the end of Lake Windermere here, we touch the grass and we land very short, it binds on the the axle wire, you can see down here how it's picked quite a bit of grass up on the axle wire. So we, we're landing probably in half the distance that we'd, take, that we'd normally land in. Are you going to get up again, though? Yeah, no problem. It's in a good big field. It's 300 yards, and they've made it a nice flattened area in the centre. Nevertheless, there are dark mutterings among the crews about the wisdom of taking off against the drag of the long grass from a field surrounded by mountains and trees. The rally is in real danger of being called off, and Bob Calvert's worried. But if he gets out, you know, well before the bump and he's 100 feet here, 
It wouldn't make life easier. Yeah, see, we're all going to take off anyway. I agree. If you can all get out of here, it would be very nice and simple. So if we wait, just wait while this single seater goes out now, and we'll see what happens. Well, it's got to be quick. You should okay. you should have gone three minutes ago. Okay. Problems already. <laughs> For the little single-seater, no problem. But with the extra weight of the two-seaters, it won't be easy at all. And already they're running late. First lot, then number three, four, five, six, and then one. So get down there. Rochdale's aviation industry is safely off. Bob Bailey, though, gets uncomfortably close to the trees. With 30 miles of rough ground behind them, the crews know the next bit should be less dangerous. A winding 40 miles, taking in the length of Windermere, a test of landing skill on the sands of Morecambe Bay, and then inland. Keep looking for the turn point. The next marker is actually on the deck of a boat on the lake. Anyone who flies too high here is asking for problems. Bob Calvert's team, however, have got the right idea. I'll check the boats as well because it could be in the water on this lake. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? I'll check left. Take a look at these markers. A test here of navigation and observation. 